Hey, good morning. Hola. Okay, open up to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. Okay, this will be the final in the series on biblical uh, manhood, biblical womanhood. And just to review, to remember <laughs> what were the main points that we had. That man was created to worship and to work. Okay. Anything else? So just quickly, first week it was we established what uh, Bible definition of manhood and or masculinity, femininity was. It basically God created us in His image, and He created a male and female. So that's how we were created. That was God's nature. Yes, we were created to work and to worship. We saw that. That was first week. We saw as well that we were because of the fall, uh, because of sin coming into place. We now have to pursue integrity, and we're supposed to pursue holiness. Uh, because pri obviously prior to the fall we would have been holy, but now we are unholy. Uh, once you are born again, though you have salvation, you still have flesh. And so your, your spirit saved, but your flesh isn't, at least not yet, not until we are changed uh, when, when the Lord returns. Or if you pass, and then you know, you're, you're going to be uh, present with the Lord. So we are supposed to pursue holiness. We're supposed to pursue, as we as it looked in, as we saw in Job, uh, integrity. We had also seen, in particular, um, as an aspect of holiness, though not exclusive, though uh, in particular, well, it's not just exclusive to the men, but we did focus it on the men. Was that we are supposed to flee fornication? Okay, um, biblical man is not one that is going to be promiscuous. He's not uh, going to be letting his eyes or uh, his heart be turned away from that which is going to be focusing on the Lord, and so he's not going to give himself to many women. He's now he's the only he's going to save himself for one, and then uh, be it. Though we were in, in this study primarily focusing on the transgender and, and how to answer, and also with the homosexuality. The fact is, even heterosexual, you're not supposed to. You know, your body's the Lord's, and that's we're, we're going to look at that today as well. That um, uh, we're bought with a price. And the fact is, you don't have a right to your own body. Uh, as the world would say, you know, I can have it my way, I can do whatever I want. Well, you can't. Um, and though you live in your body, you, you are, you know, I guess in control of it, you are a steward uh, of God's body, really, is what it is. Uh, we'd also seen as far as for the women, in particular, that they're supposed to pursue a meek and quiet spirit, which in the sight of God is a great price. And so, um, Though we can see as well as far as like in Proverbs 31 that she would be industrious uh, and she takes care of the needs obviously of her husband and of her household, uh, but primarily that the woman is, as a helper, uh, supposed to have a meek and quiet spirit. It doesn't mean she can't joke around or have fun or laugh or anything like that, but basically uh, she's supposed to be in acknowledgement of her role created at, you know, by her for God or created by God for her, pardon. And so now we looked at uh, Romans 1 as far as the underlying mentality uh, last week as to why it is that somebody would go off. Now, we, for, the, for this study, we've been focusing on as far as like the, how to deal with the homosexuality and transgender, but th that isn't exclusive to this. The how is it that somebody goes off and gets into that, or even for that matter, just promiscuity. And that is because when they knew not God, they glorified Him not as God, and neither were thankful. So having an ungrateful spirit and then rejecting the light that has been given to them by conscience, uh, by creation, and just any exposure that they would have had to, to God. God's, we know that, uh, we're told in Peter that uh, God's not willing that any should perish, but all should come repentance. And He's using us, uh, those that are us that are believers uh, to seek out uh, those uh, that are that don't know him 
And so he, we're, we're his vehicles. We're, we've been committed the not only the word of reconciliation, but the ministry of reconciliation. And so he wants uh, those that don't know him to come to know him. And we're, we're the tool that he uses. Uh, it's the Holy Spirit, his word, and then it's, it's the preacher of the word. And so um, when they have come to some exposure of light or truth, they would have rejected it. And when you reject truth, when you reject light, the only alternative you have is darkness. Right. So um, as a result, this is some of the expression of that darkness. And then today, we're finishing up with this, and, um, well, okay. Romans 1, um, well, um, we'll start at verse 18, okay. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Uh, Godhead here would be the Bible term for Trinity, even though you wouldn't find the actual word itself, Trinity, in Scripture. The concept of Trinity uh, and the term that the, the Bible uses would be Godhead. So, uh, so everybody wants to argue that. You can go through all throughout Scripture as far as pointing out, uh, even from the beginning in chapters in Genesis, that the Trinity, even though that word itself may not be found, the concept itself, and the, the, the Bible word used is Godhead. Okay, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like the corruptible man, and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. Okay, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worship the, and serve the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Uh, for this God, or for this cause, uh, God gave them up unto vile affection, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature, and likewise also the men. Uh, leaving the natural use of the woman burning their lust one toward another, men with men, work, working that which is unseemly. And then here's what we're going to uh, focus on a little bit today is receiving in themselves that recompense of their error, which was meat, or in other words, which was appropriate, which was fitting. So now you have the recompense of the error. All right, You got the payment for their sin that they're receiving, and they re it says it receives it in themselves. Uh, so, I am going to read off to you some statistics here from the CDC, all right? Now, you may want, or you, you may not necessarily want to argue, but some folks will probably argue with you about how healthy a lifestyle, the transgender, homosexual lifestyle, or even a promiscuous lifestyle is, you know? Uh, it's not as bad as people make it out to seem. you guys are just prejudiced, this and that, but Here's what the CDC has to say about it. Uh, fast facts. Gay, bisexual men, and other men who have sex with men account for 70% of new HIV infections in the United States. 70%. New HIV infections among gay and bisexual men overall remain stable in recent years. Okay, more than 600,000 gay and bisexual men are living with HIV in the United States. Okay, in 2014, gay and bisexual men made up an estimated 2% of the U.S. population, but accounted for 70% of new HIV infections. That's a pretty high rate. Okay, approximately 492,000 sexually active gay bisexual men are at high risk for HIV. Uh, and then they give a breakdown here. Uh, says, okay, we read that from 2014. Uh, the gay bisexual men accounted for 70% of new infections, and then from 2010 to 2014, estimated annual HIV infections, uh, they declined among the ages 13 to 24. Okay, that's sad that they would even start accounting for ages 13. Think about it, how do you, how do you get that? I mean, I, we know from Romans, he had initially said as far as um, you know, their foolish heart was darkened when they rejected 
Yes. I'm gonna. I would uh, perhaps be by the by the stuff being permeated in the public school system, among other aspects, television, Hollywood, the the like, that people younger and younger are being opened to these types of behavior, hearing they're acceptable, and perhaps even growing up in a family that have two parents of the same gender is also opening them up to the realities, and thus when they dig in, that's where it's, that's where probably perhaps some of these statistics fall. Those are factors. Um, there's there's one main one also that I would venture to say. Uh, most of these are introduced by abuse. Okay. Uh, <coughs> CDC actually doesn't give, or at least I couldn't find in my searches as far as statistical evidence of that, but just from personal first-hand experience as far as uh, witnessing or dealing with folks uh, on that level. Well, the ones that were willing to open up to me uh, as far as being, you know, being honest, how'd you end up like this? How'd you end up in this position? They were abused. I'd say more than 90% of the ones that I was able, as far as that were willing to open up of, of my personal first-hand experience with them. And I'm not some grand expert, but just simply saying, <laughs> a lot of that's just from from abuse. Um, okay, increased 23% among gay bisexual men aged 25 to 34, and then uh, declined 16% uh, between ages 35 to 44. Uh, <coughs> okay, in 2000, that's from 2014, and then in 2000, mind you, 2014 it was 70%, and then in 2015, um, it grew by 12% and said gay and bisexual men accounted for 82% of new HIV diagnosis uh, among all males between ages 13 and older, and then 67% of the total new diagnosis just in the United States alone. Uh, and then gay bisexual men aged uh, 13 to 24 accounted for 92% of new HIV diagnosis uh, among all men in their age group, and then 20% but 27% among new diagnoses among all gay and bisexual men overall. Uh, and then gay bisexual men accounted for 55% of people who received an AIDS diagnosis. Now AIDS would be full-blown HIV. HIV and AIDS are different, but they're, it's, HIV would be the initial infection, then you have AIDS is the full-blown disease. Uh, Sorry. Yes. Could you turn up your volume a little bit? I'm having trouble here. Okay, not a problem. I'm sorry. I'll, I'll just I'll speak up louder. I'm sorry about that. Um, here are what the CDC recommends <coughs> as far as preventatives. Okay, that they fund health departments and other community-based organizations. Basically, that you would live a healthier life, that you would, here we go, Quit smoking, don't drink. If you're gonna have sexual intercourse, then you have to uh, use protection. But nothing really addresses the fact that, like, you know, you should obviously quit the behaviors that got you where you're at in the first place. You're not, <laughs> you should, you're just not gonna find that. Even on the heterosexual searches, as far as how do you prevent STDs. That's just, this is just HIV. We haven't even looked as far as, okay. Uh, STDs. The incidence of many STDs in gay, bisexual, and other men have, uh, who have sex with men, uh, including primary and secondary, um, 
syphilis, gonorrhea, and a number of other diseases here. Uh, is greater than that reported in women and men who have sex with only women. Okay, so that's common, common knowledge. In other words, if you're going to live in a perverted lifestyle, then you're more susceptible to being sick, or to being sickly. Syphilis, you have 80.6% of male um, men who have sex with other men are the ones that account for 80.6% of the male population that have uh, PNS syphilis. You have, as far as gonorrhea, it's not quite as high, uh, but you have uh, 38.1 as far as percentage-wise. And again, their recommendation would be get yourself checked out, use protection. Again, nothing addressing the fact that you need to stop the behavior they even got you into there in the first place. You have as well <coughs> Okay, sexually transmitted diseases have been rising among gay and bisexual men. Obviously with increases in syphilis seen across the country in uh, 2014 gay bisexual and other men who have sex with men accounted for 83% of primary secondary cases of syphilis not including the other types of diseases. Um, gay, bisexual, and other men who have sex with men are seven times, excuse me, 17 times more likely to get um, anal cancer than heterosexual men. And then men who are all HIV positive are even more likely than those who, who do not, uh, as, as far as men who do not have to get that type of cancer. And then higher rates, besides having higher rates of HIV and other sexually transmitted diseases, statistically, uh, men who have sex with other men are higher, not just higher probability, but have higher, statistically, uh, tobacco and drug use, depression, imagine that. Okay, and there are many reasons why gay, bisexual men and other men, are, and other men who have sex with other men may have higher rates of HIV and STDs. It's their lifestyle. It's what how they do. Um, we see just from a quick glance of CDC statistics that it's very unhealthy. And God even speaks to this that He says that they receive that recompense which was meat. In other words, this is not natural. This is not how God had created the body to function. And there's going to be not just judgment for it, but there's natural consequences. Yes? Well, uh, verse 29, it says, you are filled with all unrighteousness. And then it starts naming a bunch of stuff. But filled with all unrighteousness, that means nothing's off limits to them. Yeah. You can, there's, anything goes. And we're seeing that today. Right. Yeah. As far as in a lot of the things that are being culturally promoted, but not only that, but also as far as what's trying to be legislated by this very vocal but small minority. Um, that, I mean, countrywide as well, but I mean, locally even. Um, but once you go there, then basically you're going to be nothing's off limits. Now, mind you, they're still able to be saved, and God's still able to change their life. God's able to restore them. Um, you might not be able to be spared some of the consequences for the sin, depending on how far you've gone. They would have, they would have gone with certain things, but the fact is, you can you can still have salvation. You can still 
once you receive the Holy Spirit, you repent. The fact is, God's got a gift. I had at least one spiritual gift for them, and he wants to use them in the church. He has some use for them, as he has for all of us. Uh, and he has that for every unsaved person. In other words, God's heart is that they be born again, that they trust Christ. And he wants to use them to win others to Christ. And he wants them also to be used within the church uh, as we are gifted so that the body with all would profit. In other words, we all, we're all gifted with something by God uh, that as we yield to the Spirit, we exercise a spiritual gift and then we, get, we can, I mean, uh, the body, the whole body would benefit. The body of Christ is going to benefit from that. Yes? Um, I'm saying an example. For example, if a drug addict gets saved, he's saved, but he's still a drug addict. Um, because he still has you know, that, that physical dependence and all that so I, I would be against letting these guys into the church because they're, they keep going down that road you know they're, they abuse people and even though maybe they'll get saved I don't think that'll go away they can get victory over it like alright if a that's a physical dependency. That's a little different. This is this is a mental choice. Uh, how about, I could be wrong, how but about I don't. Like pedophiles. I wouldn't want to have them in church. Honestly, I wouldn't either. But the fact is, they are. If they're born again, they've been saved by the grace of God. That makes them our brother, and they are gifted by God to be wise. Honestly. There ought to be precautions and measures in place so that we don't expose kids because the fact is they still have flesh and if they're not yielded to the spirit, they can give in to temptation and then they can go ahead and abuse somebody. And I don't want to be I don't want that on my conscience, I don't want that on my hands just because you know, I was being too lenient or whatever. Um, so I would it is wise to have precaution, but the fact is God still wants to use them. God does have uh, a gift for them spiritually if they're born again. Okay, but there are the, we we should have measures. Yes, we actually do have measures here in our church in our constitution. If we were reading. So, so if someone is continuing in a sinful lifestyle, obviously they're not going to maintain a membership um, of a church of, of a good church. But if someone is saved and is not pursuing a sinful lifestyle, then they're part of the body of Christ, they should be a part of the church. That's uh, They are part of God's family. And uh, they their sin, while we look at it as egregious and horrible, in God's eyes, our sin was just as egregious and horrible. And He saved us. And He allows us to be part of His family. And I mean, that's amazing. And so it's amazing on both levels. Yeah. Uh, Paul addresses it like in 1 Corinthians. In particular with there, it was fornication. You had the man that uh, had taken his father's wife. All right. Now, the church at Corinth had looked at it and be like, well, okay, it's okay. And they were boastful at the fact. It's almost they had an attitude, okay, we're more loving than God. But Paul addressed to them said, Look, it's not even named among the Gentiles that sin. And he said, you ought to, you got you to um, discipline the man. In other words, he, he can't just, he can't continue on living that way in the church. Uh, he either repents of that or you discipline him out. You, you kick him out until such time. And the, the purpose of the discipline was to restore the man. You want the man to get right with God. Does that make sense? In other words, um, what they, the man eventually repented, we know, because we see in 2 Corinthians that was written, and then he had to write to the church of Corinth and say, okay, look, it's okay to receive him back because he's repented from that sin. And the repentance would be the change of mind, and obviously it carried out, you've seen it, because of the change in his behavior. He stopped the sin, he got right uh, with, you know, the, the offend, not just the, he was the offending party, but the people who he offended and also with the church. Uh, because the thing is, as believers, 
though we're saved, we still have flesh, and we should be pursuing holiness because we're supposed to glorify God. In other words, I, my lifestyle, and I may not have that as a sin in my life, but you know, if I have gossip, if I'm a gossiper, if I'm somebody that's constantly holding grudges, a bitter person, or any of the things that we would normally look at and be like, oh, you know, that's not that bad. We typically tend to condone. Um, or even not, maybe not as the, the more visible sins. The fact is that's still something that God hates, that he writes against. And a lot of, I mean, Ephesians is really good about that. <laughs> Let him that soul steal no more. You know, and then also in First Thessalonians, as far as that uh, he that, you know, it's not going to work, he shouldn't eat. And having a bad attitude as far as being, being industrious. Uh, things like that. I know they don't compare in our mind as far as, okay, man, but homosexuality or transgender or even pedophilia. Yeah, honestly, those things are gross. Mm -hmm. The fact is, it's it's still something that Christ died for, and it needs to be purged. And even though they may not be by our standard as far as comparative, <coughs> the fact is, any any sin, any sin that's tolerated, is going against God's right. purpose and design for us. Does that make sense? Okay. And I'm not. I'm not. Again, I'm not trying to condone or make an avenue for somebody to be able to come in and abuse somebody. That's the last thing we would want. Uh, but if he's if he's saved, I can't. I honestly, I can't argue as far as the fact if he's born again, he's a brother, regardless of where he you know stands. If he's right with God, in other words, he's repented, he's walking cleanly, then I don't have you know. But if that's going to be an issue, if that's going to be something with which he struggles, then okay, we have to be wise about it because I don't want to have, you know, an incident where, okay, maybe he gives in the temptation and the next thing you know, okay, now we have you know, abuse that went on. Um, so we, you know, we, we, have to be, we have to be wise about that. But the fact is he's still a brother. He's, if he's born again, he's, he's gifted by God to be used in the church. That's, that's his purpose. That's what God does. Right. He takes sinners and, you know, declares them righteous. But because they trust in him, they see cleansing from him, he cleanses them. Uh, he gives us his righteousness, and then now he gives us, and he trusts us with, you know, the ministry of reconciliation and the word of reconciliation. Does that answer your question? Uh, a little bit. Um, I don't want to be rambling. No, no, no. I just thought about Judas Iscariot. Um, you, know, you know, he was like he was like an imposter. He was never saved. He tricked people. Um, and I'm not saying I don't think every every homosexual can't be saved, but I, I would think some of them would lie to have access to children and stuff. Yeah. Try to infiltrate. Yeah, it could be with any sin. So it's a thief. The truth is, the person knows, and then God knows whether a person is saved. I, I can't look into your heart. All I have is. Have you, yeah, well, everyone's gonna have one five No. Have yeah. God, yeah, certainly. Sin. But I don't know. <laughs> Um, and again, this is an attack at you, but I don't know if you're saved. I don't know if Tony's saved. All I have to go by is your testimony because I can't. And, and, and yeah, but I don't have. I can't. I can't look into somebody's heart. So I don't. Yes. In First Corinthians six, um, in verse nine, it says, "Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate." And then obviously. And with your abusers of themselves with mankind's um, topic of what you're, you're talking about today, verse 10, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor, nor revilers, uh, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Verse 11, and such were some of you. So he's speaking to the church in Corinth, and they were those things. They were abusers of themselves with mankind. They were effeminate. They were idolaters, they were adulterers, they were all those things. He says, but you are washed, you are sanctified, you are justified in the name of the, uh, our Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. So yeah, I mean, you never really know someone's sin background, um, and unless they confess it to you, um, you don't even know, really, who's in church. I mean, 
Um, we've been here a number of times. Uh, you know, I pastor a church in New Jersey, and um, you know, we want to be vigilant. We want to be wise, and we don't just put anybody in any place of service. Yeah. But we're washed, we're cleansed, and and Paul lists those specific sins, and he says, "Such were past tense some of you." And so God can save us and, and put us in service. Those people were in the church in Corinth, and God was using them in the church. That's true. Thank you, brother. Yes, sir. That's a good point. <laughs> Thank you. There was a point that I was going to go. Um, all right, so the lifestyle is unhealthy. Um, they have higher rates of not only disease, but also of, in particular, mentioned depression. Uh, actually, suicide rates, if you want to look at it, at those, which we're getting ready to look into uh, for our next study, uh, uh, next Sunday School series on depression and suicide, are also a lot higher. Um, typically because it's a lot higher for men that actually follow through on suicide. Uh, men in general just have a higher suicide rate overall than women do. Um, so they, they get... Well, no. they, they, they kill themselves. They're more successful at the attempts than, uh, than what women are. Uh, but the fact is, as far as these men uh, who are involved in this sin in particular are uh, a lot higher probability, even among just the general population, uh, between, if you break down between heterosexual and homosexual, uh, than, than any other, uh, as far as... So now, what would be the remedy? I know we, we keep mentioning this over and over again, but what would be the remedy? How do we address this? How do you uh, combat this? The gospel. Yeah, amen. Preach the gospel. We need to... Well, it goes without saying, we, we that are born again should actively engage. Uh, we shouldn't be fearful, and we shouldn't back down. Uh, now granted, they're not the enemy, though a lot of what they push is pretty vile. The fact is they're not the enemy. They're, they're the mission field. All right? uh, they're controlled by the enemy. They've given themselves over to be influenced by the enemy, the enemy heavily, but the fact is they're not the enemy. All right? Satan's the enemy. Uh, and though they may have given themselves to total control by Satan or just allow his heavy influence on them to go ahead and what they push for. The fact is God still wants to see them saved. So we ought to actively, we, we need to be aggressive in our approach as far as seeking out and in addressing the fact that, hey, listen, you need God, you need Christ, you need to be born again. Two, uh, we need to set an example by living a holy life, okay? If you are single, then purity, well, not just single people, married people too. The fact is, the uh, Bible tells us marriage is honorable and all, and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. Uh, it is astounding, just in the New, I mean, not just in the Old Testament, but in the New Testament alone, how often the issue of fornication and holiness comes up. It's just like in your face continually. Uh, now, I understand that a lot of the folks that Paul ministered to were Gentiles, uh, but the fact is, no, Israel went into captivity because of the idolatry, which fornication at root, at its heart, is idolatry, Okay, which addressed in the last two of the Ten Commandments. Basically, you view that this relationship or this sin is going to be something that is more pleasing than my relationship with God. Mm -hmm. right, and so we ought to be a shining example of the fact that, listen, uh, even if nobody else, even if you're not in an environment where you have uh, Christian parents or Christian neighbors or Christian friends, and you may be the only one you feel like, man, I'm the only guy out here, you feel like an Elijah. Uh, the fact is, there's 700 that haven't bowed their knees to Baal, or 7,000, I'm sorry. And then you have the fact that, you know, you have the Holy Spirit of God, and greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. One, you have power, supernatural power, 
if you would, by faith, access it to be able to not only resist the temptation, but also to be a shining example of the fact that, look, God's word is true. Uh, and he, he wants to use you in that way. That's what we're designed for. Uh, it doesn't, it conflicts a lot of times with our uh, American culture as far as to pursue, you know, the American dream. And again, there's nothing wrong with having things, but the fact is where we seek nice, comfortable life, and then, you know, we want to check out and retire and just live nice, but the fact is we are to be soldiers, and we're supposed to do a hardness as soldiers. That's what God has called us to, okay? And that's not to be mean-spirited or ugly, but the fact is, is we're fighting for the souls of men. All right, now God's greater, and he's the one that gives us the strength, and we're supposed to uh, rest in his power and his might. Uh, we're supposed to put on his armor, but the fact is, we, we're designed, we're created by God, because now because of the fall, all right, he's, we're, we're supposed to be soldiering for him. Again, part of that is gonna be, you're gonna be conflicting you're going to be fighting against evil. And there's going to be contention there. There's going to be, you know, there's going to be pushback. There's going to be pain involved in that. But the fact is, it's worth it. it you know, it's, it's not, com not not going to be compared to the glory that's going to be following. And, you know, to have the rewards that are going to be, be able to cast down at Jesus' feet. Uh, so we need to be proactive. We need to be aggressive in our approach. Uh, not only in seeking out those that are lost, but also in trying to and to be holy, to be that example, you know, if nobody else, uh, I came to this conclusion a long time ago, and again, I'm not the, you know, uh, the most stellar uh, uh, of Christians, but the fact is, I, when I was in Hawaii, I used to struggle with that a lot as a baby Christian. I was like, man, why in the world is it I get the most wicked of roommates or whatever? And then it just, it, it, like God really, <laughs> it felt like he kicked me in the gut, kind of in a sense, uh, when I was I was reading, when I, well, when I was doing my devotions, and then he um, he pointed out the fact is, it's like, okay, I put you here for a purpose because the fact is, who else is going to reach these people? Who else is praying for them? Who else is going to, you know, uh, invest the heart and effort to want to see them come to know him? And the fact is, okay, that's that's for all of us, right? We have our sphere of influence, and we need to be, we need, we, you know, if even if nobody else around you is, uh, go to Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11. Uh, starting at verse 11, it says, Through faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful who had promised. Okay, therefore sprang there even of one and him as good as dead, so many as the stars of the sky and the multitude, or in multitude, and as the sand which is by the seashore innumerable. These all died in faith, mind you, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from which, or from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But now they desire a better country that is in heavenly, wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for He hath prepared for them a city. All right, verse thirteen. These all died in faith, not having received the promises. Uh, he starts off talking about Abel, faithful Abel, and then he goes to Enoch, and then he goes to Abraham. He talks about Sarah, which we just saw <coughs> immediately. Uh, but the fact is, Abraham had been promised from early on in his well, he would have been sixty-seven, probably I think, roughly, when he when he when he left uh, Ur of the Chaldees to go to the land which he knew not. Uh, just because of God's promise, and he counted him faithful, and then uh, he gave, he was given promise a little bit later on after that as far as he was going to have uh, a seed, and that through him all the families of the earth were going to be blessed. 
he gets again later on reiterated that promise when he sees that okay this I haven't had a child yet now he sends it he listens to Sarah and then they have a relationship with Hagar and then you have Ishmael come about off there all that but the fact is he got right with God and then he um, further on down after he's after <laughs> as well as a hundred you have Sarah giving birth to Isaac um, but the fact is he never got to see the sand of the sea shore multitude of children that he was going to have all he saw was Isaac um, and then same thing with Sarah but they saw far off and now not only speaking of those but the fact is that you had the others now, okay why did I mention that the fact is it is possible that though we may not in our lifetime see the fulfilling of that which God has promised to us, but we can go down uh, to our grave if, if, if God doesn't return first, faithful to him, believing in those promises, and God, that's how God is well pleased, mind you. It's by faith. You, there's, without faith, it's possible to please God. And that's what he's addressing. There are some, actually there was many, far more many that received promises, but there were a lot that did not. He speaks of it to the end of the chapter that some were sawn asunder. Uh, they wandered about in deserts and goatskins, uh, destitute. And, you know, they were tortured, uh, not having received deliverance. But they died in faith, and they pleased God. We can do the same, okay? It's the same God. And though we're far removed from the culture and all that stuff as far as these people, the fact is they're still human. And we can do the same thing. We can just be as well-pleasing to God. And so let's seek to be uh, well-pleasing to Him. And, uh, and let's seek to be the example of a biblical man and a biblical woman. Okay? Pursuing holiness. Having an industrious spirit. Recognizing the fact that, hey, this is what God has created me for. Uh, you know, fleeing fornication and being an example of that, of that purity uh, that this world needs. How often do you see that promoted? You often see it. I mean, I remember growing up, and I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm 41. Uh, and I just remember it was like, that's unheard of. You know, I, we had, I, now I was public school trained all the way. There was a portion of time where they had what they called abstinence training. But I remember just with my classmates, it was like, okay, this is interesting. But most of the people ridiculed at that. Like, yeah, right. You know what they do? They give out condoms, like, you know, like crazy. And they tell you, okay, hey, you know, do this or do that. But the fact is that, you know, that it was laughed to scorn as far as abstinence. Wait till, wait till you're married. Who does that anymore? You know? who, <laughs> who even marries anymore? Seriously. That's true. Yeah, most of the time it's questioned as far as, like, why? Anymore it's like the homosexual, the, even the transgender or whatever, because they want to promote that, hey, we're just as normal as everybody else. But the fact is, just among heterosexuals, who's marries anymore? How, what's the... The percent, well, the percentage rate of kids out of wedlock. And I'm not talking just, okay, in the hood ghetto areas. I mean, even just at, everywhere. It's pretty high. It's ridiculous. And why? You know, men like darkness rather than light. We need to be that light. We need to be aggressive in our stand, obviously, you know, for the word of God, for his truth, and for purity. All right, does anybody have any questions? Yes? Um. Well, you said that, you know, we should try to give them the gospel and everything, but what about if they're already saved and then they get into the lifestyle? If they're saved and they got into the lifestyle? After they got saved. Are they promoting it? Not sure. Okay. I'm, I would, here's what I would say, all right? God's able to give you victory over any sin. The fact is your flesh is susceptible to in Galatians, if we walk in the Spirit, you know, we should not fulfill the lust of flesh. And then he goes on and he names off a lot of the same things that we read about in Hebrews, or excuse me, not in Hebrews, in Romans 1, as far as flesh is flesh. Right? If you're not walking in the Spirit, if you're not yielding your life to God, if you're not renewing your mind daily, then yeah, you're going to go ahead and you're going to, you know, if you're just living according to the flesh, you got death waiting. But the fact is, if you if you're born again, then one, you need to repent. You need to view your sin as how God sees it. It's wicked. It brought Christ to the cross. And the fact is, you can't maintain fellowship with Him. 
Um, you need to repent of it. You need to adopt God's view of your sin. And then you need to take steps and measures so that you are guarding yourself from falling back into it. You need, you need, to, you just, you need to repent. And you need to walk in the Spirit. That's that's for any believer. I mean, that's not just. I mean, that's for any sin, really. That's that's how you would address it. But in particular, okay, if you're gonna, you know, you need to separate from the friends that you know. What's influencing you to want to go and think that like that way, or to pursue that? Separate from that. Social media or any type of media influence. Get rid of that. Put replace it with good stuff. Stuff that's gonna feed your mind, feed your heart, feed your soul for the things of God and keep you focused on. On the things of the Lord, and keep you on an eternal focus. That, did I answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Anybody else have any questions? All right. So next week we are going to start a series on depression and suicide. Okay. And then one, what does the Bible have to say, and how can we deal with it biblically? And uh, you can have answers and help uh, if you find yourself in a state where you are. Uh, constantly feeling down or depressed, uh, God's able to help you. God's able to give you victory over that, and then you will in turn be able to help others that find themselves in that kind of, kind of condition. All right, so we're uh, dismissing.